Hello, um, and welcome to my presentation on the lost Vikings and the disappearance of the Greenlandic Norse in the 15th century. Um, and thank you for choosing Salvin Room, I guess. <laughs> so, oh, there we go, Creeland. Uh, the unforgiving Arctic island of black earth and white ice. It contains some of the world's most inhospitable conditions and ranks high for most dreary weather. Nevertheless, it was home to one of the most remote European settlements for over 500 years. The Nordic settlers of Greenland lived and died in their icy land from around 985 AD to 1500 AD. In 1721, missionary Hans Egel travelled from Denmark to Greenland, hoping to convert this long-lost colony to Protestantism. Instead, he discovered that their civilization had suffered a catastrophic collapse sometime in the 16th century. When asking the Inuit peoples where he could find the Norse, they merely pointed to a settlement of ruins. He questions, were they destroyed by an invasion of the natives or perished by the inclemency of the climate and the sterility of the soil? Oh. <laughs> so I forgot I had that in there. Um, <laughs> This essay um, will follow in his footsteps and offer an explanation for the extinction of the Norse in Greenland. I will be drawing on contemporary sources, both written and archaeological, alongside more recent investigations by historians including Kristen Siever and Jared Diamond. I will be assessing what I and others see to be the most likely cause of their demise, namely climate change, environmental impact, greater isolation and conflict with the Inuit peoples, although it is it's fairly likely that at least all of these played some role in, uh, in the collapse. So, to give a bit of background, it only takes a brief understanding of the landscape, location, weather, and the weather of Greenland to draw some fairly obvious conclusions as to why farming settlements may have struggled. The expanse of tundra and mountains which Greenland offers certainly doesn't invite the possibility of agricultural miracles. Even the name of the island has become somewhat of a running joke with everything from tourism books to sketch shows poking fun at its visibly inappropriate title. I don't know if the sound's going <coughs> to... <laughs> Despite what the comedy stylings of Mitchell and Webb suggest, the naming of Greenland, along with its discovery, promotion and founding, was done by Eric the Red who first set foot there in 985 AD, after being exiled from both Norway and Iceland on the basis of committing a number of killings. Eric Saga states that he selected the name Greenland in order to attract settlers in what would become an incredibly successful Norse PR move, resulting in 25 ships venturing there from Iceland the following summer. Many historians have framed this as a sort of trick, but later scholars have suggested otherwise. Siva, for example, remarks that since most of the settlers coming to Greenland would have been eking out a difficult existence in some of the less desirable farms of Iceland, the sheltered fjords in Greenland's more temperate south would have been highly desirable. These were green and littered with groves of birch trees and rowan trees, which we know um, would have been a lot better than the, the flat lands of Iceland. A contributing factor to such a reportedly mild climate may have been the appropriately named medieval warm period, which lasted from around 800 to 1300 AD thus aiding this positive view of Greenland in the eyes of the would-be settlers, and also enabling the steady growth of the population to around 5,000 in the turn of the century. This, coupled with the Icelandic origins of many of the migrants, will help, will help us later to understand their way of life and decision to remain in what would become an increasingly hostile environment. So when looking at this broader picture of Greenland's climate around the time of the Norse settlement, we have to consider the transitional period between two distinct climactic periods, that being the previously mentioned, um, previously mentioned medieval warm period and that transition into the Little Ice Age. So unfortunately, the Norse, as well as failingly, failing to record the reasons for their demise, equally failed to record the weather that served as a backdrop for it. But fortunately, archaeologists and historians alike have proven useful in the absence of such records with a variety of alternatives. Recent investigations have used methods such as ice core analysis and the study of contemporary Icelandic climate records to be able to provide a clear look at the worsening conditions that the Greenlanders had to endure. As you can see from the graph, the slow decline in temperature correlates to this time, oh, how do I do the thing? There you go. Uh, correlates this time from 1300 to 1500 AD, which is not only when we know this little ice age began, but also when the Norse civilization began to collapse. 
Evidence for toffee living conditions is also exemplified in a number of investigations which show an increased um, proportion of marine life in their diets, which is strange as fish was not commonly eaten in Greenland, unlike Iceland. Therefore, oh, <laughs> however, the Nordic people had survived cold periods that preceded this and had not been saved by warmer periods that came after it. Therefore, we cannot say that the, that the Greenlanders simply starved to death because of the increase in cold. Such shortages, did, such shortages did, however, create a more fragile society and one that was increasingly vulnerable to a variety of outside threats and compounding difficulties. However, it was not only these greater, unchanging climactic forces that played a role in the Greenlanders' demise. Indeed, there are many ways in which the Norse can themselves be blamed for contributing to their own society's collapse. There are three primary ways that they did this, namely deforestation, soil erosion, and cutting turf. Unfortunately, I only have 15 minutes, so I'm only going to cover deforestation real quick. So, unlike the nearby coasts of modern-day Canada, Greenland is not especially rich in woodland. This situation was not improved by the settlers' decision to, upon their arrival, burn much of the forested areas around the settlements for pasture. Much of the remaining trees would then be cut down for lumber and firewood. We know this because of the study of pollen spores, which show a rapid decline of birch and willow pollen around both of the main settlements in accordance with the coming and going of the Norse settlers. Aside from the environmental impact of such actions, this major deforestation would have led to some major problems. For example, it affected their ability to build both shelter and transportation. And unlike their Inuit neighbours, who had adapted to burn, burn blubber to um, heat their shelters and light their homes, the Norse continued to burn wood. Dwindling lumber supplies prompted a number of expensive and dangerous journeys to the nearby Labrador coast uh, in modern-day Canada, uh, which only added to these compounding difficulties that the Norse had to face. Additionally, archaeological evidence has suggested that there was a huge iron poverty in the Nordic settlements. Like the Scandinavian forebearers, these communities obtained a majority of their iron in the form of bog iron. This process of extracting the iron itself requires a large quantity of wood, and getting the um, iron to this temperature would have used up valuable lumber resources that they, couldn't, they just simply couldn't spare. This iron poverty continued despite expeditions to mainland North America and imports from Norway. Their eventual trading separation of Norway and um, Norway and Greenland uh, would be eventually even more damning as this reliance of iron made them even more reliant on it. More so, without iron tools, these European settlers would have no technological advantage over their Inuit neighbours, something that was seen a lot in uh, South America, for example, uh, with the conquistadors. So, being a settlement of European origin, the Greenlandic society received both material and cultural exports from Europe, primarily from Norway and Iceland. This trade was vital to, vital to the settlement's existence and its self-identity. The journey from Norway to Greenland was fraught with danger. Medieval era vessels were often shipwrecked or simply lost on the week-long journey. These ships came to Greenland for prestige goods, which were found in the northern hunting grounds in the northern Greenland. These consisted of walrus tusks, walrus hide, live polar bears, and the tusks of the narwhal. Live polar bears is actually a legitimate thing. They would take these live polar bears on these sort of tiny longboats back to Norway for weeks, which I've always found ridiculous. <laughs> uh, a fantastic example of this ivory being used in Europe um, was in the uh, Lewis Chessman found in the Scottish Hebrides, which is a fantastic bit of um, archaeological find. So this, the importance of this trade can't really be overstated. The imports of iron, as I previously mentioned, were vital for the settlement's survival, as were this cultural and material exchange of religious materials, church bells, ornaments, different new ideas. So what you had here was Norse going further into these dangerous hunting grounds in order to attract Norwegian, Norwegian traders to come, because without these prestige goods, they wouldn't come and they'd be cut off. So this made life even more difficult for them. One of the reasons for the disintegrating contact between Greenland and the homelands of Europe were the physical barriers brought about by the Little Ice Age. Historians generally agree that temperatures began to drop more regularly below freezing after 1250, and thus the northern sea pastures through which sail sailors would have passed became increasingly clogged with ice. The sea ice led to an increasing number of shipwrecks and failed expeditions which released in a complete ceasing of all trade. In 1410, the last recorded ship left the shores of Greenland for mainland Europe. 
Another wouldn't arrive for over 300 years. They were now on their own. Although that isn't entirely true, because throughout all of this, the Greenlandic Norse were sharing this island with the Inuit. They form one of the most mysterious and the most unknowable chapters of the Nordic disappearance. Their existence as a hunter-gatherer society, sharing the island with the nomad, nomad the pastoral Norse seems to put the two societies at odds with each other, and early records would sin certainly indicate a less than friendly series of first interactions. The name given to the Inuit alone, Skrelings, which has many translations, including scruffy wimps and wretched ones, indicates a level of disdain for their northern neighbours. One source we have of contact describes the Norse testing to see if the Inuit were human. When they are stabbed with a non-fatal wound, their wounds turn white and they don't bleed, but when mortally wounded, they bleed incessantly. So that's, uh... <laughs> However, despite these less than hospitable relations with the, despite these, these less than hospitable relations, we have limited records of any major conflict. In fact, we only have two other written accounts of any form of contact. Both are of violent raids and paint the Inuits as being the attackers preying on the Norse uh, from above. One, although brief, suggests that the Inuit as being a primary cause for the destruction of the Western settlement around the year 1360. However, as Samuel Elliot Morrison points out in 1971, that the Eskimo may have moved on Brahilde when its survivors were too weak to resist, but the attack was merely a coup de grace to a dying community, dying of isolation and undernourishment. Uh, this is the Western settlement here, and this is the Eastern settlement. There's two distinct settlements that I've been talking about. And this one uh, was destroyed first, and later this one. So, if I can sort out my <laughs> cards. There we go. Nope, where's that gone? I do apologise. And so, with all this information, we can start to build up a picture of the final days of the Norse settlement. In fact, that's exactly what I've done. Although not exactly academic history, I've written a semi-fictional account of the end of the Nordic settlement in Greenland. This winter had been cold, bitterly cold. Even by Greenlandic standards, the people of Eriksfjord had never experienced anything like this before. Even the Jarl's great longhouse was battered with the chill of the Arctic winds and ice clogged the fjord. The harvest had been poor and food was in short supply. People had started dying fast. It had begun with the settlers on the outskirts, those who had no possessions to burn for warmth. Reports of bodies found frozen in their houses and starved to death began to circulate and desperation spread with them. While the hunger and the cold crippled every Nordic soul, they knew they were being watched. As farmers shuffled through the snow to tend to their animals, they saw shadows shift along the mountaintops. Skrelings. There was nothing to be done about it. The last of the iron had been used to repair the church's bell and no ships carrying supplies had arrived in 20 years. The Skraling simply lingered. They wouldn't have to wait for long. Indeed, after seven days of suffering, the settlement began to fracture. The remaining settlers, living on the fringes, travelled to the court and pleaded that the remaining supplies be used to travel across the ocean to the relative safety of Iceland. Driven by hunger, cold and fear, a great shouting match began between those who wanted to take the risk of navigating the icy waters to safety and those who refused to leave the land of their ancestors and wanted to wait out the winter. Soon, the shouting match escalated into a brawl and it wasn't long before weapons were drawn. In the chaos, the Jarl was killed and panic ensued. Looting and fighting spread throughout the settlement as people desperately tried to get their hands on any food their neighbours had stored away. Those who couldn't defend themselves fled into the mountains into the hand of the Skralings, while others, in their confusion, ran onto the thin ice of the fjord, which cracked, sending them tumbling into the icy waters below. The Skralings then descended, killing those left behind. By the time the winds had ended and the ice began to melt away, all that, was le all that was left were the ruins of a society that had stood for five long centuries. That's uh, the end. <laughs>